VLS coordinator and one of the paramedic instructors here at NABTC. Today we're going to do a brief demonstration of the equipment, show you what it is, how it functions, and go over a basic BLS airway management for our patients. So today we're going to try to do a very basic demonstration of our airway management assessment. So anytime we're managing a patient's airway, it's the most important thing that we can do for this patient. Without proper management of the airway, none of our other interventions mean anything. So for a proper airway management, we need to make sure that the airway is open, that is patent, clear from any foreign matter, and that we it's secure. So when we come through, we're gonna go over the ways, if we're gonna open the airway, we have two different methods. So we have a patient who's laying supine, unresponsive, and we need to manage this patient's airway. So if we don't suspect that there's any trauma, we can use the head tilt chin lift method, okay? To do the head tail chin lift method, we're gonna come in, I'm gonna place my hand on the forehead, and I wanna find the bony prominence of the chin. I don't wanna to go to that soft tissue, I wanna find the bony prominence. I don't wanna cause any damage to that soft tissue. Now, with my fingers on the chin and my hand on the forehead, I'm going to open that airway, okay? So the reason that we wanna open the airway is that the tongue is the number one thing that causes airway obstruction in our patients. So by opening the airway, we will be able to reposition that tongue. And if the tongue is what's causing the problem with the airway, it's, that's what's occluding it, then we're going to be able to help dislodge that and see if our patient starts breathing spontaneously. Now, if we have a patient who has suspected trauma to the C-spine, so to the head, to the neck, to the back, then we don't wanna grossly manipulate them. So we don't wanna cause any type of flexion or extension that could exacerbate that injury. So what we want to do is what's called a modified jaw thrust. So this is a very small movement. It's just enough to displace the tongue. So we're finding the, the mandibular process. So if you find it on yourself, you're coming down to the mandible. Remember, the mandible is the only movable part of the facial bones. So you're finding the mandible. You're finding those mandibular process, and that's where we're going to start to dislodge. So what we're looking, if you look profile, we're just looking to dis displace the jaw. So it looks like that. The jaw is being displaced. So if I come in on my patient and I'm up at the head of the airway to manage this, I'm keeping my patient in a neutral position so as not to manipulate, manipulate the C-spine. Finding the mandibular process, my thumbs are here on the maxilla, and all I'm looking to do is come in and this modified jaw thrust is just to displace the jaw. So it's a very slight movement, just enough to get that tongue out of the airway. So we're going to pick the proper method to open the airway, and that's the first thing we need to do. Anytime we're gonna ventilate our patient, we need to make sure that we have that airway open. Okay. So the second part of our airway management is checking if this airway is patent. So once we have the airway open, so if our patient doesn't have any C-spine injury, and we're able to open this airway with a head tilt chin lift, I wanna be able to take a look into the airway. I'm looking for any vomitus, any sputum, any foreign body that could be occluding the airway. Do I need to suction? Is there anything there that needs to be removed from the airway? I'm never going to go in and do a blind finger sweep. So we don't do that anymore. We're not going to stick our fingers into an unresponsive patient's mouth. So if we look in and we determine that there is a need for suctioning, then we're gonna make sure to use our suction device. So anytime that we're managing a patient's airway, we should always have our portable suction near us. If we're in the back of the ambulance, then we have our wall mounted. Uh, suction device. But anytime that we're going to manage someone's airway, the potential that we need to suction to keep that airway patent is very realistic. So we want to make sure that we have that. Other thing we want to make mention of is make sure that we have our proper PPE. So we'd be wearing gloves. And if I'm suctioning someone, if I'm managing someone's airway, you want to protect your eyes and your mouth. So you don't want any of that sputum or lung butter coming up, hitting you in the face, getting in your eye, or getting in your mouth. So always protect yourself, proper PPE. And this is where now, if we've determined there is a need for suctioning, we've got to start making some determinations. So for an adult airway, I'm going to go with my Yankauer tip. So the Yankauer is this hard plastic tip, and it's got this little thumb port. So the thumb port is what needs to be covered to activate the suctioning, the vacuum device. So this connects to this clear tubing, and this tubing connects into our collection device. And this is where all the stuff we suction out of the airway is going to get collected in here. So this is always gonna get disposed of in a biohazard waste materials um, section. So this doesn't get thrown into the trash, you don't dump it on the side of the road. This is, is disposed of in a very particular and specific manner. So for this portable device, 
this is going to be our, our dial. So this is our vacuum setting, and it's measured in millimeters of mercury. So when we turn this on, if I don't press this thumb port, nothing happens. As soon as I put my thumb, if you can hear that, you can see it kind of start to suck my glove. So that's what we want to do when we're looking to suction an airway. We need to make sure that this is turned on. Now, any time that we're going to suction someone's airway, and we're going to use this device, we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of this distal tip. So we would never just take this and slam it into somebody's airway. We're going to cause damage. So the other thing to be aware of is that in the back of our throat, and again, this is a kind of gross simplification, but we have what's called the vagus nerve. The vagal nerve runs posterior. So if I take this device and I go too deep with my suctioning and I stimulate that nerve, that nerve is going to cause the patient's heart rate to brady down, so the heart rate is going to get really low. It's going to drop their blood pressure, and those are all really terrible things to do to our patient. So again, we never want to cause harm to our patient. So we're never ever going to lose sight of this. We're only going to suction as far as we can see. So if I have this airway open and I'm coming in with my device, I'm going only as deep as I can see. If my, I'm able to, and I'm able to get my patient up on their side to help use gravity to clear the airway if we don't have a suspected C-spine injury, then I can do that. Otherwise, I want to come in and I'm going to suction, again, not losing sight of the distal tip, covering my thumb port. We're going to suction on the way out. So we never press this, cover over our thumb port, and suction on the way in. Always on the way out, and for no longer than 10 seconds. So we don't want to suction longer than 10 seconds because while we're suctioning, we're depriving our patient of oxygen. So if we had a lot of you know, kind of thick vomitus, uh, we weren't able to clear the airway, the patient was actively vomiting, then we would continue to suction longer than that 10 seconds. But for somebody that we're just looking to kind of clear some obstructions, a good rule is no longer than 10 seconds. Then we want to immediately get back to being able to ventilate our patient or providing them with supplemental oxygen. Three. So the third part of our airway management is going to be to secure this airway. So we've been able to open the airway, we've determined whether or not we needed to suction. If we did, we're going to suction appropriately. And now it's time for us to secure this airway. So if a patient is unresponsive and they've lost that tone, so when somebody is completely unresponsive, the part of the brain that controls their level of consciousness, the reticular activating system, the RAS, when that, when that, that is engaged and they are fully unresponsive and, and unconscious, they're gonna lose their tone, which means that their, their muscles are gonna become flaccid and limp. The tongue is a muscle. So this is why when people are uh, truly unresponsive, that tongue is going to lose its tone and it can fall back and occlude the airway. So our first device that we look at is our OPA. So the OPA, this is just a piece of hard plastic. So this is a little flange that's going to sit against the lips. And we're going to be able, you can see that it's got a little port here, where we're going to be able to, to ventilate through this device. So with my OPA, and these come in all different shapes and sizes and colors, it all depends on the manufacturer, but we're gonna have, uh, however they're packaged for your agency, you'll have a bunch of different sizes. So we need to select the one that's going to appropriately fit for our patient. So we're gonna measure our OPA from the tip of the ear to the corner of the mouth. So the way we do that is we take this device and I'm measuring from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the ear. So we can see that that fits, it's not too big, it's not too short. So this fits our patient pretty well. So now that we have the appropriate size, I've sized it from, again, that tip of the ear to the corner of the mouth, now I'm going to do what's called a tongue jaw lift. Okay. So the tongue jaw lift, this is where we're going to be able to insert it. Now in your book, you're going to see them talk about that scissor technique. So that scissor technique is when you have these crossing fingers and you, you spread them to flip open the airway. Personally, I don't like that. I, I don't like putting my hands in, I'm rubbing them against the teeth. But when your book mentions it, that's what they're talking about. It's a scissor technique that your fingers cross while trying to open this airway. I like doing the tongue jaw lift. Again, you want to be careful anytime we're coming in. So I always have my OPA ready so that if I'm using my thumb to help secure this tongue, I have this here as a biting block. So if all of a sudden my patient were to convulse, they don't snap down and bite off the end of my thumb. So tongue jaw lift. I've got a good hold of the airway. I'm coming in and I'm coming in at 90 degrees. Okay. So as I come in, I'm going to rotate this OPA into position. So now the flange is going to be flush with the lips and it sits nicely. 
The other way that you can do this is after you've measured it, you can come in at 180 degrees. So that, you come in like this, and you do a rotation and put it into place. Both ways are correct, they're just different. So um, you want to find an EMS that there's more than one way to do lots of these skills. So your book will talk about that 180 degrees. Here's the reason that the 90 degree is my preferred method. And again, 180, 90, both of them are, are acceptable ways. If I'm coming in at a 180 degree angle, I now have this, which is rough plastic, and I'm up at that soft palate of the mouth. So if I were to do this incorrectly and I were to graze that, I could potentially cause damage to the tissue of the soft palate, causing my patient to bleed, and now I need to worry about suctioning. So again, both ways, they're absolutely fine. They're appropriate to do. Tongue jaw lift, coming in, 90 degrees, turning that, and now it's flush with my, my lips. My airway is now secure, and I'm ready to ventilate my patient. So now, the OPA, when we use this, this is going to be for an unresponsive patient and a patient who does not have a gag reflex. If my patient does have a gag reflex or my patient is, is semi-conscious, then I'm going to use my, my NPA, my nasopharyngeal airway. So this adjunct is soft and flexible and it's got a beveled end. At the other end is this trumpet. So same as the OPA, I'm able to ventilate through the fenestration of the device. So if my patient has is either semi-conscious or they have an intact gag reflex, then we're going to use this NPA. So the NPA, this bevel end, we always point the bevel end towards the septum. So the septum is that deviation in the middle of the nose. So we have our nose, and on either side we have two nares. So if I'm coming in, I want to go bevel end towards the device. Now, because uh, this is going in up through the mucus and the turbinates of the nose, we're going to make sure that this is well lubricated. So we're always going to use a water-based lube, right? So we're going to be a good friend. We're going to lube this up. This is going to come in, and I'm going to go in a twisty turning method, and it's going to kind of bounce back and forth, and I'm going to guide it until the trumpet sits flush with the nary. The thing with the NPAs is I can use one NPA, I can use two NPAs, I can use two NPAs and an OPA. I can do whatever I have to to make sure that I secure this airway. The reason is because if I don't manage this patient's airway, nothing else, none of my other interventions matter. If I don't have this airway open, if it's not patent, if it isn't secure, then no matter what I do with my BVM, trying to ventilate this patient to get oxygen into them, isn't going to matter because it's not going to get where it needs to. So that's a complete airway management assessment for our patients. Open, patent, secure. Uh, hopefully you were able to learn something. If you'd like to see more of our videos, please subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them for us in the comment section below, and we'll see you next time.